Hello, good afternoon from New York City. Thank you everyone for joining our LinkedIn Live. So I'm Nikki, uh, I lead marketing communications for Insight Partners and this is part of our, oh wait, we're still not there apparently. Um, this is part of our Scale Up, there we go, Scale Up Milestone series, um, where we bring on our portfolio company CEOs and talk about the incredible milestones um, that they have been able to achieve and go through as they've continued to scale their business. So who is Insight Partners? Um, Insight is a software, a leading software investor and a trusted scale-up partner in the software ecosystem. We've invested in over 400 companies and we help them scale and grow. Um, what we as a firm are most proud of is that we're there for our portfolio companies as they navigate the different milestones uh, that are instrumental in their scale-up process. Uh, we navigate the turbulent times and we're able to provide stability through all the data that we bring and we're also able to help them take flight. So today I'm really excited to bring on uh, two speakers today. First of all, we've got Richard Wells, Managing Director at Insight Partners. Richard has over 20 years of experience in investing in and advising high growth software companies. Richard has sponsored over 20 investments, realized 15 acquisitions and two IPOs. Uh, he focuses on application software, infrastructure management, DevOps and cybersecurity. And then next up, I'm very excited to introduce the CEO of OneTrust, Kabir Bade. So Kabir is the founder and CEO of OneTrust, and he oversees all aspects of the business, from product development, operations, and also sales internationally. Kabir was, in 2019, was received the National EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award and was named Most Admired CEO by the Atlanta Business Chronicle. But today we're here to talk about the path to one of the, a very impressive scale-up milestone, which is the Inc. 500 fastest growing company in America. So welcome, Kabir and Richard. Really grateful to have you on. And Kabir, I had to have up the Inc. 500. <laughs> cover page to kick off. But um, I just wanted to, before we dive into the sort of the Inc. story and the accolade um, of the Inc. 500, I wanted to kick off, who is OneTrust and, and how did the idea for the business come about? Yeah, so um, actually Richard was involved in, in part of how the idea came, came involved, in, I would say maybe indirectly or directly, but um, Richard uh, had actually been the partner at Insight that had funded uh, the company I worked for previously called Airwatch, um, gotcha. and at Airwatch, we you know we built a technology that monitored mobile devices to help the IT department make sure they were secure. And when I started realizing, I was in a role where I was responsible for implementations with big companies like GE and Shell and Procter and Gamble, and in Europe, they didn't like deploying Airwatch. And so <laughs> as I started to learn why, um, they always blamed privacy. And what I learned is by monitoring an employee's device, the IT department now knows the name of every app. And just think about, Nikki, what apps you have installed. Too right? many. Yeah. <laughs> but it could, reveal, it could reveal, you know, which dating app you use reveals sexual orientation. There are mm -hmm. apps for religious texts. There's apps for medical conditions. And so this is a major issue. And... Um, and so I started learning about those firsthand and learning about how privacy was so important. Um, and I actually created a privacy initiative at Airwatch to solve those problems and learned about this entire industry of privacy that was just at its infancy. Um, and that's how the um, idea for One Trust was born. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, don't don't tell my boyfriend about any dating apps. But that's, <laughs> but that's true. When you actually sit and and think about your phone and your devices and how many times you're giving away your data or how many times you're installing things on your phone. So let's unpack data privacy um, and that concept of trust a little bit more before we dive into your scale up story. So in my very humble opinion, um, one trust has really created a new that new category, the category of trust. And, and this is a question for both of you as kind of experts who've looked at this sector. Why is it important that businesses, not just, I, I get it when I'm talking about myself and the apps on my phone, but why is it really important for businesses to think about trust and to make sure that their company is seen as trusted? And, and what does that even mean for a B2B business? Yeah, there are a few things. So I think it's it's number one, extremely timely in today's environment. When you look at 
buying decisions and buying patterns and, and customer loyalty from the millennial generation, the Gen Z, or, or as I call it, Gen Zoom, they make buying decisions based off of trust. And you see this, I mean, you see all this stuff in the news publicized around cancel culture. That's ultimately about trust. And what we learned through our journey is a lot of this started as privacy, as a very timely regulatory driven issue. But in the grand scheme of things, a consumer doesn't really know the difference between privacy, security, your transparency, your, your ethics, your responsibility. They just want to know, do I trust you as a brand? There are a lot of pieces that go into that. And uh, Gartner does a, a survey every year of the top 10 priorities of CEOs every year. Mm -hmm. And usually the top 10 priorities are things like, I want to make more money. I want to take care of my customers, take care of my employees. Never in the history has trust or risk management been a top 10 priority on any CEO's radar. It's usually shoved to the corner of some compliance function and mm -hmm. not strategic. The first time ever this year, it was number nine on wow. Gartner's top 10 CEO priorities. And it was growing at a 39% growth on the priority list, which means it might be number seven or, or number six next year. Um, and, and it's all about risk management and trust. And, and it's also, a, you know, a, 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 from an executive risk perspective, it's a personal risk for people as well. If you're involved in running a company and, and things aren't happening ethically, you're seeing people <laughs> go to jail and, and their personal brands and reputations being impacted. So it's an extremely timely issue. It has undertones of regulatory drivers and things you have to do, but also mm -hmm. competitive differentiation now. Look at Apple, the billboards and headlines are them competing on privacy and trust and, and ethics. And so organizations are starting to um, really notice this. And all of those things wrapped together is what makes this so critical. And, and as you, you described this category defining event of what is the technology infrastructure, we need to manage that and report on it and be transparent oh. on that. Mm. Richard, yeah. what is yeah, your first foray trust? Sure, just to, I mean, just to build on what Kabir said, I think. Um, all these Richard, your audio is not great yeah, for me. I don't know. Lean forward a touch. <laughs> there we go. That sounds great. Is that any better? Yep. Okay. So, um, you know, from a business, to, you asked Nikki, uh, B2B businesses, why should they care about this? I mean, I think, you know, one of the biggest topics in every B2B business right now is the, the notion of uh, business transformation, digital transformation. So by definition, mm -hmm. digital transformation means you're, you're making everything digital. And once you digitize all the activities and data that your business is interacting with, then the fundamental question of what are you doing with that? Is that data safe? You know, who gets access to that data suddenly becomes very relevant. So businesses that are already further along in that, um, these are the, the, um, uh, the on online giants like Facebook and Google that already have been trading in that. You know, they're, they're further down the maturity curve, and that's why those CEOs are showing up in front of Congress and, and, and having to deal with that. Um, and to Kabir's point, um, you know, that's where you're also seeing things like the CEO of Apple distinguish on what he does on data and, and trust and distinguish that relative to the CEO of Facebook. So it's already right. becoming this for industries that are a little bit further along, but as everyone embarks on their digital transformation initiatives, this is what happens next. And you know, I think one of the um, things that's happening with the pandemic is that's pulling forward all this digital adoption, digital transformation, which means the urgency of this is growing even more clearly um, for just about every business. And definitely an illustrative of the scale that One Trust has had. Um, so, Richard, you, uh, as Kabir said, you were there for the kind of creation of One Trust. Um, tell me about how that relationship started from your perspective, and kind of what you saw in what Kabir was thinking and building, and 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 why you were so excited to get inside involved. Well, you know, the concept of trust uh, uh, has a lot to do with uh, how relationships are built, and particularly with uh, founders that are building a high growth business that have a lot of challenge, have a lot of choices. Um, so Kabir's partners now in One Trust, um, they were built as they were building uh, Airwatch. You know, they they had it was another high growth business um, that they had uh, largely financed themselves. They had a lot of investors lining up outside their door, and one of the key things that 
uh, Insight had to do back in the 2012-2013 timeframe is um, not only communicate our value, um, but really win uh, their trust. And so that was a big uh, part of our success. And you know that that ended up being a very rapid success story. You know, um, uh, VMware started pounding down their door not long after we invested, and finally they broke through. And we were very supportive of of the entrepreneurs uh, and leaders of that business figuring out what they wanted to do. And as Kabir um, uh, started building his company, as uh, some of those backers and leaders of one of Airwatch backed Kabir uh, and, and supported him his leadership team in this. And as the company progressed to the point where they started being interested in the notion of getting some outside help versus just doing it themselves, again, that, that concept does come back. And um, so Kabir and I uh, didn't meet when he was at Airwatch. We met, uh, I think it was last spring. And um, spring of 2019. And again, you know, uh, a big, Entrepreneurs like Kabir have lots and lots of choices. So um, presenting how we can help as he's gonna scale his business and his team scales his business. Um, but then also um, winning that trust, showing that um, we are the kind of high caliber, uh, just people. Because yeah. you know, when you embark on this journey together, um, you know, it, it goes all the way through and there can be twists and turns. and you know, so um, I, I think that was a key thing that uh, Kabir honed in on. That was a key thing that um, obviously his partners had had honed in on from before and continue to hone in on. And ultimately, um, the last piece is, you know, investors, people in the investment business, the finance world, they can make doing deals hard. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be that, but they can. And entrepreneurs, look, they're, they just want to get back to building their business. So you, you make it hard against this notion of trust. They, they start to distrust. They don't understand. They start to distrust. So, But that's a choice. And um, I think uh, we managed to, uh, to not screw it up, so to speak. And you won over his trust. Um, well, could be on that. Um, and the idea that you will go through many twists and turns and obviously your uh, very fast and one trust very fast rise um, has been stratospheric and awesome to see. But tell me about some of those earlier moments and those um, difficulties and channel challenges and hurdles that you and your leadership team had to overcome and, and you know, was raising capital one of them? Yeah. I, so, you know, I mean, I think if, if any entrepreneur answers the question as one big challenge, I think they're... <laughs> they're they're probably uh, hiding a little bit because there's a hundred small challenges that really add up uh, along the way. Um, you know, for us, our market was really unique in that there were two huge learning curves um, that both required, you know, a, a huge amount of capital and investment and talent and technology. The first is it, the complexity of the regulatory environment and privacy. Um, especially in that it's it was an unsolved problem. There weren't existing technologies that were really solving it. The fact that we had to understand and read this 500 page GDPR that lawyers all over the world argue over the interpretation of, and we had to build the technology, not only understand the law, explain it to people in a way that us, we weren't telling them how to do things, but we were just showing our expertise operationally. And then also inventing and de developing an entirely new category of software. Both of those things are very hard. And that's also why I think we've tackled that and in, in in, in it's been a barrier to entry for new competitors because mm -hmm. you can be a great lawyer. That's very different than building great technology and having both of those in a way that's just practical. I remember talking to the CEO of one of my competitors who, who ended up not, not scaling and, and kind of disappearing. And he would say, Kabir, I don't know how we can build technology in this market because every customer wants to do it differently. And I was like, that's the key problem that I figured out how to solve that mm -hmm. everybody else said, well, if everyone does it differently, how do you build technology? And it's a combination of understanding the regulation um, building a simple technology that's configurable, you know, and it sounds simple, but it's it's very hard in practice. So one of the keys we did early on was I put in the employment contract of every single employee that they have to get a industry certification on privacy law. 
And this is a certification from a group called the IAPP that even lawyers fail. The unintended consequences was, um, and the benefit was that it self-screened out people yeah. that weren't ready. I mean, it's it's like built-in talent management. Like you don't have to do performance the management. process was tough, yeah. but it's tough. Yeah. So it was, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I was I was very blessed in that. I'm a first-time entrepreneur. Richard was the first investor I've ever, I ever met with and the only wow. investor I ever pitched to until earlier this year. And still in my life, I've only pitched to two. You, Richard, and, and Co. too. <laughs> Never pitched to anybody else. So yeah. I was... I was very lucky and, and and unusual in that I was able to build the trust of the Airwatch executive team who I worked for to come help me. They had a relationship with Richard to know that, you know, we we could move fast and do all those things. And I didn't know the value of raising outside money. I was I was actually, you know, very skeptical. And Richard will tell you. Um, the inside team chased me for over a year before I even took it, responded to an email or picked up a phone call. Um, uh, because I just didn't even know the value or, or why somebody would need to raise outside money when I had existing business partners that were flush with cash funding the business themselves. Yeah. Um, and so a few things, and I didn't even know this when we decided to raise money on the value inside would bring. You know, the first that I appreciated when, when Richard talks about trust, to me, that was alignment with our business goals was number one. So Richard knew we wanted to move fast. I think from my first pitch to you, Richard, to closing the deal was like four weeks, <laughs> maybe. It was like a series A, two million dollars. Yeah, it, might have been. it was, it was it unbelievable, was right? Yeah. So that alignment yeah. with our business goals where Richard said, we understand your business goals. We're going to prove we can move at your pace and we're not going to slow you down. Um, and also knowing that Richard's team are very patient investors. They're not going to put a gun to my head and say, we got to exit. We got to hit short-term returns. We can't invest in a big way. That's so critical and, and um, something I've really appreciated. But the the confidence that having an institutional, um, uh, a VC fund at the credibility of Insight gives both our own internal team and employees, yeah. um, in terms of us knowing, are we tracking the right metrics? Are those metrics where, you know, I'll ask Richard, like, is this net revenue retention number normal or not normal? Like, we, we just don't know those answers yeah. without having someone like Richard to calibrate on us. And the confidence that shows our customers accelerated our growth, like way beyond what I ever expected. Um, in the in, in when you have private funding like I had originally, you don't get the publicity of being on the Cloud 100 list, the Inc. 5, you know, you don't get these recognitions because they base it off of, you know, funding rounds. And so, yeah, I, I didn't even know that, right? So immediately we became on the map, right? We It was like almost like our, you know, like our, our public appearance party and from a marketing perspective, it helped us sell and grow. I didn't expect that. You know, I just thought it would be money, not actual mm -hmm. marketing. Uh, it's a marketing investment we made. Um, the M&A, probably the most valuable thing, Richard, your team has been doing is helping us source and evaluate M&A. Like I've never needed to hire a corp dev team because your team does it better than anybody else. Yeah. Um, and what I'll say, what I've learned to appreciate, Richard, about our relationship over the last year is... I have, I would say, very close relationships with my board members, but everybody comes from that AirWatch background. And being able to call you as mm -hmm. an independent voice on, you know, hey, what should I be doing here? And, you know, what is your advice to me personally? It's a completely balanced, independent voice um, that I can have, like, very candid, frank conversations with on what I'm struggling with and get different opinions. So it's been like absolutely uh, of, a, of, a, of a massive um, relationship for me that even when I signed the, the term sheet, I didn't know that, that that value would be coming with it. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Richard, like uh, as a board member, um, and I know that you take that relationship very seriously. Obviously, for those who are listening, um, we have at Insight, we have uh, Onsite, which is the industry's largest operations team that work day in and day out with functional um, leaders across sales, marketing, M&A, strategy and analytics. Um, but then we also have our uh, investors who are active board members. And so, Richard, as a board member, what are, what was it like, some of those conversations? How did you provide the type of support and, and help navigate some of those hurdles for a first-time, very successful entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, look, working with Kabir and his team is, is phenomenal in that, um, you know, we've made 
I mean, Nikki, you'll probably know this number better now. How many hundreds of investments in high growth software companies have allowed just the last 10, 15 years, um, let alone the number of active portfolio companies we have today? And so the the customer intimacy and just that sheer level of hard work is are two of the biggest traits we've always seen over time um, that really distinguish um, you know uh, high performing uh, leaders and high performing management teams. Um, Kabir and his team have that in spades. I think one of the key factors in um, folks that are able to lead hyper growth companies is is actually something different than may or nearly come to mind. Um, it's humility. And how that translates is how do I get better? What I have now, the company I've built now for this certain size that I am, I'm trying to be much, much bigger in the next six, 12, 18 months. The business that I'm trying to add over this time frame is bigger than the business I was in, in an entirety not too long ago. So just that pace of growth and the challenge of that, it means in a lot of ways, just the company building is just, it, it's so profound. And you need to be able to ask yourself, how do I get better? How what is what 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 does the business need to look like in the future that is different from what it looks like now? Then layer on on top, this is a new market. It's evolving. This product category was more important within it. This product category is now less important. This product category is rising in importance. How do we shift? Because again, being close to that customer, you see that. But again, you know, it's it's when you're winning, you know, you're growing really quickly. Uh, you're getting recognition from your industry. You're getting recognition from investors. You know, you're getting a lot of positive feedback that it's working. So, like, why change? And um, and you change because you're humbly looking at this and saying, "This is what I'm trying to achieve. How do I get there?" And being willing to change. So, I'd say it's uh, uh, it, that's that's a key criteria because it, it takes that humility to pick up the phone and say. Um, we're seeing this. Does this match what you're saying? Is it different? Oh, that's different. Oh, this is, and you have to be willing to hear, hey, you know, you're not the head of the class. This is an issue. This is an issue. Is well based on what else we're seeing? And you need to have that level of humility to ask that question and then do something with it. And I think, you know, it's 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 not talked about a lot with these hyper growth companies um, and their leaders. Uh, in fact, often, um, people talk a lot about the opposite <laughs> and all the hubris. Um, I think that humility is really such a critical part. And I think that's that's embedded in what uh, Kabir just Definitely. spoke to. And I, I'm going to pull away from the humility because clearly you've um, reached the benefits of asking all of those questions and, and, and really testing yourself and testing your organization and putting in the hard work. And that does result in something that we can have a little bit of hubris about. Um, and that is your Inc. 500 file. I mean, I, I would say that, good, that, one's, that one's Come for on. my mom. That, you know. <laughs> it's, a lot it's, of the company awards are like for the company and for the growth, but like being on a cover of a magazine is like that made my mom proud and that's like all that matters. <laughs> That's a pinnacle yeah. scale up milestone for sure. Um, but you did mention sort of, I guess, the the PR halo that comes with this, but it is so much more. Winning, uh, you know, being having this type of accolade, it's something a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses truly do strive for, but um, I'll take that off for you. But what has that uh, meant for you and the business uh, and your mom, but, but really for you and the business and kind of how is that translating into how you're thinking about what's next for the company's growth? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's 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 two sides to it. Um, you know, one is, it, you know, a recognition like that establishes a, a milestone that um, is important to celebrate. I mean, it's important for our team because as a private company, you a lot of your employees work so hard and you're winning deals, but you lose sight of how are you actually performing relative to others. Right. Is everybody else growing that fast? You know, I always tell our team we're growing so fast. You know, that, you know, th that's why some of these pain points happen. That's why we got to tackle some of these problems. That's why we reorg every every quarter. Um, but having the perspective on where that stacks with the industry, not just our industry, but all industries in America, 
um, it is really important for how we tell that story and explain things to our employees and how to help them get it. Now, the, the downside of a recognition like that is it does come with it, it, you have to actively fight against the complacency and the hubris that, that Richard mentioned, where all of a sudden your sales team might get a little bit arrogant and just assume they're going to win the deal. Because yeah. why wouldn't we? We're the number one company. Why wouldn't we fight? You know, why would we spend a little bit extra time fighting a little bit harder for that deal? Why would we try to change what we're doing? And, um, and what is the next milestone that we can look forward to when you already got to that number one spot? Um, and, you know, I think it's, there's a, there's a set of challenges there that you can't not celebrate something like that. But as soon as you celebrate it, you kind of have to change the story and say, you know, that, that, that's last news already. So what, what is next and what do we have to do to push and develop? Um, and, you know, 48,000% growth, you, you don't, we're not going to get that growth next year. That's a three-year time period in the past. So, Expectation yeah. management. Yeah. It's like, it's like a very awkward thing on how you, how you manage going forward and, and don't let that achievement you know, almost backfire on you going forward. And I think that's something we're putting a lot of thought into um, and having a lot of conversations around as well. Amazing. Uh, well, I was I was just about to say, and I kind of two more points. Um, the growth that you've had, I think you've grown to over 1,500 employees. You just said 38,000% growth, which is just mind-blowing. You're in over nine countries across 12 offices. Um, Building a culture that can scale as fast as you have um, is a challenge and and something that I know that One Trust has really invested time and effort into. But how have you gone about building the One Trust culture and, and encouraging that humility and making sure that people are always looking at what's next and are along for such a fast paced journey? And where have you sort of leaned on your outside advisors, whether it be Richard or the others in your Airwatch family? to really build that culture that can run at the pace that you have? Yeah, th so I would say this is something I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and th there's not an easy answer to it. And I haven't been perfect in how we do this by any means. And we're constantly evolving and changing it. There, there are a few key things. So number one, I think being unapologetic about what your values and expectations are during the recruiting cycle is critical. So unapologetic that to be an employee at OneTrust, you're going to work harder than you would at another company. You're not going to have as much of a work-life balance. You'll have some, but you're just not going to have as much. You have to be at a point in your life where you want to prioritize your career and accelerate your career. And so how do we be unapologetic about that is, is number one. So we get the right people and obviously setting the expectation that within 90 days of getting a job, you got to get certified. It, it, a certain caliber of person is going to apply for that and not apply for that. We have to be okay with losing great candidates because they wouldn't be great cultural fits. So that's kind of number one. You know, we, we, we have to fight the pressure of somebody coming in and, 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 being a great background fit, but not a great cultural fit. The second is every single employee we hire in any function, you know, we have a saying that says everybody works for sales, everyone works for support, and everyone works for recruiting. So only three functions of a software company. You win customers, keep them, and hire people to repeat the cycle. It's like, that's all there is to it. And so if people are territorial on, well, why, like, I'm an engineer, this should be an engineer, you know, come. it's like, no, we, we all sell and we all support. You know, if you're not on board for that. And so regardless if you're in HR, engineering, finance, everybody in our company goes through a one-week boot camp that is essentially a sales boot camp. They learn the product. They learn how to demo. They learn how to pitch. And as part of that boot camp, I do a one-hour personal culture talk on what is our culture. You know, it's things like we hate to lose. What does that mean? We're hungry and humble. What does that mean? We always take the high road ethically. What does that mean? So we reinforce those values on, on kind of day one. Um, uh, and that's an extremely important part of our onboarding. Now, I think one of the keys that I'm still trying to figure out is what is the right level of ongoing reinforcement of that every single day? Like, do you, on every all hands meeting, do you have to repeat that or is that the right thing or not the right thing? So there's certainly challenges we have as you scale 
and also knowing which of those values need to change as you scale because they're going to be different yeah. types of people as you go through different maturity points. And then when you change those, how do you re kind of indoctrinate it? And I would say the key support I need from, you know, Richard and my board and my investors is when you have a really specific culture like that, not everybody's going to like it. People are going to say nasty things on Glassdoor. People are going to go say nasty things in an article, some of which are true, just positioned in a, in a negative way rather than a positive way. And some of the things are just untrue. Like we made a mistake, hired the wrong person. They weren't the right cultural fit. Um, and then they went and said something nasty. So the support you need from the board member is, you know, agreeing on those values, agreeing that not everyone's going to be a good fit and making sure we're all on board with that. So we're not constantly fighting all of those things. Um, but also being open to, I mean, changing when the, you know, cultural issues and the Black Lives Matter issues came out, like diversity and inclusion wasn't part of our culture. Right? Like it just wasn't, uh, you know, we, we were focused on survival and winning and market share. Like that was our culture. You know, I had a conversation with my Richard and I, you know, talked for probably hours during that time period to say, do we need to change culturally in some directions and those types of things? And, and we made those adjustments and we made some announcements. And I think that type of dialogue and support um, and, and is, is, is the critical factor here, you know, and I think, you know, Richard hasn't given me crap for people that say, well, you know, nasty things on, on Glassdoor, but he pushes me uh, on, on the diversity and things we should be uh, improving on. And I think that's been a healthy balance. Definitely. I think yeah. I mean, I think one of the things, one of the things that, uh, we benefit from, um, at Insight, and I don't think particularly fully realize it, um, until we're out there engaging with the leaders we work with is just how much we see. Um, and we see, you know, with 150 plus portfolio companies, we have quite a bit of surface area to the world today. And because we've been doing this for so long, um, we, we have a longitudinal perspective. And so look, you know, there, that's what leads to, from Kabir's standpoint, the practical thing, like, look, I'm not going to, you know, a, a zinger on glass doors, not something to get worked up over. If you're not, if, um, to some extent, it is um, uh, a little bit of the, what happens when you're driving hard and, and, and growing fast and building the kind of culture that Kabir and his team wants. Um, but then there's also things where, no, this is this is actually a big deal. And, 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 and I think as an investor and a board member, um, you know, that's where you provide help and leverage to the CEO. You know, if you're calling about this knit and that knit, um, you're just, you're actually just being a pain in their butt um, and not being high value. But if you're pointing out, no, this is, this, act, this thing actually is a big deal. And let me explain to you why. And it's um, and and then you fall back on what else you're seeing across our service area of 150 plus companies. What this has evolved over the last 15, 20 years of doing this. Um, you know, I think, I mean, that's quick counsel, but it's high impact because again, when you're running the kind of company Kabir is, you have to imagine he's not sitting around with his feet up at his desk that often. So being able to quickly and succinctly get at key things. Um, and help them navigate it. Um, I mean, that's that's part of what we have to do. And trust. You can't have that type relationship. You do have trust with your investor and with the entrepreneur. So I think that's, um, I'll, I'm going to end with one last question. For all of those startups who are going to graduate into the scale up phase and are really going to be, um, you know, looking to become that next Inc. fastest growing company in America, um, Kabir, what would be some of your your one piece of advice that you you'd wish someone had given you? And and Richard, same to you. You talk to so many entrepreneurs and get and provide that trusted counsel. What's that one piece of advice as people are about to navigate scaling up? <laughs> the, the one golden piece of advice, um, you know, I, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, it's tough. I mean, I've 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 learned a ton. I think the the one kind of cultural thing that drives everything we do that that I've learned along the way is just what we always call hate to lose. And I learned this from John Marshall. You can probably imagine our mm. one of our chairmen who um, who was a founder of Airwatch that, that Richard had funded. And he had come to me one day and it said, Kabir, there's two types of people. There's people that like to win. Who likes to win? Everybody raises their hand. It's like, all right, that doesn't make us different. Everybody mm. likes to win. Everybody likes to high five and celebrate the wins and think the one out of 10 wins is great. 
And then there's people that hate to lose and obsess over it and just don't rely on hope, but have a plan and a structure to guarantee the outcome of winning. And then if you ever do lose, you fix that and don't let it happen again. And and that culturally has driven so much of, of my learning and my journey in terms of we look in every deal and situation and analyze what are all the different reasons we could lose. And that's what's driven our product strategy. We could lose because there's a slightly different market that's coming into our market. And maybe there's an incumbent mm-hmm. company there that has an incumbent customer base. We have to disrupt them before they disrupt us. It's that it's that paranoia, almost like a control problem. We're <laughs> like, you know, we, we have to control the outcome and we can't ever rely on chance or hope. Um, and, and it transcends every part of your company in every way you think about building the organization. Um, and getting everyone rallied around that makes things very unemotional in, in how you make decisions. You can lower your price um, without worrying about, okay, on a renewal, we're going to lose revenue because we lowered our price. That's okay, because if we don't do that, we're going to lose anyway, right? So like we, we've got to be thinking about all those different things. And, and that, I think, framework of hate to lose has made decision making at our company much easier, um, and, and that's something I've I've definitely learned, and has been probably the most valuable piece of advice um, I've gotten. Amazing, Richard. Yeah, I go back to the the point I mentioned earlier about humility. So, I, I mean, if you're entering that scale up point, you, you have a product, you have built something, you're getting some people to use it, and you're getting some positive feedback, and so it feels good. And so, but the road ahead is different than the road you just traveled. And so the way humility translates, not in a, oh, shucks, no, I'm not that great. No, what it is is looking at where you're trying to go and having an openness to consider how the road ahead may be different than the road you just traveled. And that extends to, Kabir just gave a great example of that. Hey, just because we've done it this way, things are changing. Maybe I need to do something different. Maybe I need to reconsider. And that can be everything from how you price, how you package, how you what you're building in your product. Maybe some of the, uh, the, the, the type of talent you're bringing in, maybe even new parts of talent, maybe even new parts of the organization that you, know, you didn't really think about before. So that mindset is a big deal. And it's hard to do because you built a product that someone's buying and using. You're getting positive feedback. You know, it's not it's not the cover of the Inc. 5000, but you're getting positive feedback. And so, but staying, finding that balance and, and continuing to challenge yourself and being willing to roll with it is is really a big criteria, big factor in the folks that are able to keep moving. Definitely. <laughs> Everyone that was listening, thank you so much to Richard and Pierre for joining on our LinkedIn Live Scale Up Milestone series. Today, we really learned about trust. Uh, trust is a new industry and one that every business should be thinking about. Uh, trust that I should go and look through all the apps on my phone and potentially clean some of that up. But also <laughs> trust that you develop with your investor and trust that you develop in your culture with your employees because the Scale Up journey is a series of twists and turns and ups and downs and having the trust of those around you to really run and scale is critical. So thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much, Kabir. And um, chat to everyone soon. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Kabir.